Thank you very much, Martin, for the introduction. Thank you to the Mile End Institute for hosting today's event and for this reflection on John's legacy and uh, on the work that he did. It is an honour to be here to talk about John Smith 30 years on from his untimely death, which stole from the Labour Party a great politician, a great leader, and from many of us, a great mentor and a friend. And as I was thinking about um, what to say today, I was talking to my um, daughter about um, the fact that I've seen and worked for seven elected Labour leaders since I was first old enough to vote 37 years ago. My daughter just shrugged and pointed out that she'd seen seven Conservative leaders <laughs> since she was old enough to vote just seven years ago. I want to also thank David, David Ward, for the invite to come and speak today, because David did so much to support John and John's work over very many years. And it was when David was John's special advisor, he gave me my first job in politics as an economic researcher in John's office back in 1991. And I still remember my first day. I had to meet David in Central Lobby, and then we had to go through this tiny door and you wouldn't normally notice it because it's actually behind where the TV cameras are now stationed in Central Lobby. And then down this narrow, tiny little staircase to two small offices with windows like prison cells. And one was John's and then next door to it, the office for Anne Barrett, John's secretary, for David, and now half an extra, an extra half a desk for me which was all we could squeeze in. And I remember thinking it was a weird place to have a shadow chancellor's office. And then I found out why. Because Anne greeted me warmly and opened John's door so I could say hello. And then she cried out in frustration, oh, he's gone again. And it was a cry that I would hear very often because no matter how tight a grip Anne tried to keep, John would just regularly disappear because he was off for a chat. He was off to catch up with someone. Is in the hidden in the world before mobile phones, having this dingy hidden office that was just downstairs from the tea room, it was just downstairs from the smoking room, it was just downstairs from the whip's office, just round the corner from the leader's office, just along the corridor from the bar. That was how we found out what was going on. That dingy office was our equivalent in 1991 of WhatsApp. John loved it, it drove Anne up the wall. But there we were, right in the belly of the House of Commons and right at the heart of things, which was how John loved it. And people would sometimes say, well, what was John like to work for? And I think really what you saw was what you got. What the public saw was what I saw in those offices too, that sense of decency, the integrity, the deeply caring family man, the love and pride that he had in Elizabeth and his daughters, Sarah, Catherine and Jane, the wit and the humour. His, his love of the absurd, the, the twinkle in his eye, and someone who was as happy debating with the CBI as with the Scottish TUC, as talking to Edinburgh lawyers or to Ravenscraig steelworkers. He was as happy drinking in the Airdrie Working Men's Club or in the House of Commons bar. And his love of argument as well, but also the respect he held for the people he argued with and the respect that he inspired in people in return. The way that he argued was about, in the end, building consensus. It was about persuading people as well. And yes, I remember too the fierce, controlled anger that he felt about the damage the Tories were doing to Britain and the forensic focus that he had in pulling them apart in the most scathing of ways. So yes, I feel I learned a lot about how to do politics from John Smith. But most of all, what you saw was his deep passion for social justice, his deep anger about inequality. And I remember one time being in a taxi with him. It was on the way back from a city lunch. It was part of the prawn cocktail offensive that he was doing at the time. And John was expressing immense irritation about a newspaper column that was saying he didn't have a big idea. And he just said, I want to stop children and pensioners living in poverty. That is the big idea. And that was what drove John. And there'll be others, including in this room, who knew John better than I did. There'll be others who have studied more of his background and his life story. 
But I just want to just reflect a bit on John's legacy and some of the things that I saw and how much it matters still today. Because look, all of us will know the political caricature of John is that of the Scottish bank manager. And don't get me wrong, in those halcyon days before RBS, being a Scottish manager was still a good thing and a steady thing. And so we were quite, quite pleased with the caricature at the time. But John's also been criticised for being too cautious or too careful, for not being radical enough, for not doing enough to help Labour win. And of course, he faced criticisms for the shadow budget blamed by some for Labour's 92 defeat. But I want to tell a different story because my view is that John's role, both as shadow chancellor and as leader, was a crucial part in getting Labour to that 1997 election victory. That his legacy was lived out in the winning campaign that we ran in 97 and in the transformative work done by the last Labour government. And, that det and in the resilience of the Labour Party through the highs and lows of the three decades since. And John's determination to be both credible and radical, his passionate advocacy for social justice and economic efficiency going hand in hand, his combination of principle and pragmatism, and his willingness to work to bring people together to build trust and decency in politics are as important now today as they were 30 years ago. <clears throat> so I'll start by talking about John's enduring work to restore our <clears throat> economic credibility. And Neil Kinnock appointed John as Shadow Chancellor in 1987. It was just after our party's third defeat by Margaret Thatcher. We'd come a long way since 1985. Neil had fought to remove militant tendency and we waved roses, not flags. But we weren't yet trusted on the economy. And John was determined to rebuild the support that we'd lost and to restore the confidence that Labour could be trusted with the public finances. He met business, he met industry, he argued for an economic strategy geared towards sustained growth for that partnership between dynamic markets and an active state. But a central part of restoring that economic credibility was fiscal responsibility. And so when I first arrived in that dark, dingy office, in 1991, the first task I was given was to go through all the policies Labour had and to cost them. It was 18 years before I became Chief Secretary to the Treasury and 31 years before I then sat with Rachel Reeves in the shadow cabinet supporting her commitment in our next manifesto that every single policy will be fully costed and fully funded. And our experiences then in 91 and 92 had a huge impact, they had a huge impact on me, but on the huge impact too on the whole of the Labour Party and have shaped many of the ways that we approach things since. So as requested by John and Margaret Beckett, who was the Shadow Chief Secretary at the time, I meticulously went through our policies. We had two core documents, meet the challenge, make the change, and then look into the future. We had a lot of policies. We didn't have a lot of ways to fund them. And the Tories' recession had struck, the costs of unemployment had soared, and the revenues of growth had collapsed. So Margaret Beckett, as Shadow Chief Secretary, told everyone that whilst they might still be our policies, we would only implement our policies as resources allow. But the Tories costed our policies anyway. Not accurately, but it didn't matter. They launched ad campaigns about our £35 billion tax bombshell, and they stuck. So the shadow budget in spring 1992 was John's attempt to limit the damage by setting out priorities and how they would be funded. But we'd already lost the argument on tax and spend. We ended up being seen as anti-aspiration and voters just weren't prepared to take the risk. <clears throat> After the crushing defeat then in 1992, when John became leader, appointed Gordon as shadow chancellor and Harriet Harman, as Chief Secretary, between them, they determined that we wouldn't make the same mistake again. That we would not announce policies we could not pay for. John was clear about that. We would show we were serious about delivering public money, public trust, delivering what we promised. That we would never again allow the Tories to undermine our economic credibility in that way. And that lesson John was so clear we had to learn in 92 has been part of the way the Labour Party has responded to elections ever since save for a notable recent exception in 2019, for which we paid a damaging price. 
Today, those tables have turned. Today, it's, the, it's been the Tories who launched massive unfunded tax cuts in the mini budget, crashing pension funds and pushing up mortgage rates. And it's the Tories now who, with their promise to abolish national insurance contributions, have an unfunded £46 billion bombshell that we will be relentless in our, attempt, in our uh, campaign to expose. But what's underestimated alongside that determination that John then had to build our economic credibility as the platform for being able to change the country was also how determined he was to combine being credible with being radical. Yes, he had a different style to his predecessors and his successors. Every leader finds their own voice <coughs> and their own way of doing things. But David Ward has described John as being cat-like. Careful of his footing, but ready to make bold jumps. Canny, as if his passion for climbing Munro's had kept him focused on the wisdom of checking the ground beneath you before you launch down your chosen path. And contrary to that picture often painted of John as the cautious, he in fact developed bold and brilliantly progressive policies, which did ultimately help change the face, not just of the Labour Party, but change the country too. So yes, he was a realist and a pragmat pragmatist, but there was a determined radicalism on the economy, on devolution and reforming the Labour Party. He always argued economic efficiency and social justice go hand in hand, and he fought hard crucially for the minimum wage. He was one of the hardest, uh, the strongest advocates of the national minimum wage in the face at that time of fierce opposition for some in the unions, and then later from those in business and particularly, of course, from the Conservative Party. But he ensured it was firmly embedded in the party's policy review in 89. He robustly defended it from attack in the years that followed, which ultimately led the way for what the Resolution Foundation just this year have labelled the most single, most successful economic policy in a generation and one of Labour's proudest achievements. He fiercely rejected the laissez-faire Tory attitude of the day and was scathing about a government whose economic approach in tough times was just to brass it out. On devolution, he helped forge a new radical constitutional settlement. And much of his thirst for reform was rooted in the battle for Scottish devolution in the 70s, when he was given the job of steering the government's devolution bill through the House of Commons. But he led a debate which culminated in the huge swathe of devolution and the realization of the Scottish Parliament three decades later, and he was determined that power and decision-making should not be a treasure hoarded by a few in Whitehall, but that political institutions should respond to the needs and the aspirations of all parts of the country, bringing politics closer to the people. And then, thirdly, he was a party reformer. So even before the high-profile debates we may remember about Clause 4, it was John who brought in one member, one vote as a mission to modernize Labour's way of making decisions and policies so we never again tumbled into an out-of-control policy program as we did in 1983. And as my colleague, Shadow Cabinet colleague Pat McFadden has said, it actually took a tough internal battle to do so, it took great bravery to carry that battle through. And he didn't stop there. He introduced the National Policy Forum in 1993, a dynamic policy-making process the Labour Party still uses today. But now, too, we feel the echoes of John's experience again today. Certainly for me, that 1992 election was formative. Never again count any votes before they're cast. And we always know we have to earn support. But we see now today some echoes in the view that greeted John Smith on his first day as leader of the Labour Party in July 1992. What he faced then was a Labour Party being rebuilt after a foray into militancy, communities eviscerated by years of economic neglect, families worried about how to put food on the table or pay their mortgage, and public services, especially our NHS, feeling broken, and a deeply unpopular government mired in corruption and cronyism, and something that I personally can relate to, those long and frustrating years in opposition. But John faced those challenges with steely determination, with steady judgment, with decency, and with purpose. 
As Donald Dewar, his great friend and colleague said, John sought power not for what it did for him, but for what it might allow him to do for others. And yeah, he hated being op in opposition and bitterly regretted the lost opportunities of the 80s when there was so little he could do, the frustration of not being able to affect change for those he represented, for those he feared were struggling. So yes, we do feel those echoes today, not just in the state of the country, the state of the government, the state of the Tory party, but in a re-energised Labour Party coming back from de defeat. And the Shadow Chancellor and Rachel Reeves determined to build economic and fiscal credibility. And a leader in Keir Starmer, who has the steely determination, the sense of decency, the steady judgment and purpose, not just to change the Labour Party, but to change the country at a time when our country is indeed crying out for change. And just as John would talk about the sense of purpose in politics, Keir Starmer talks about the missions for a Labour government, from clean energy by 2030 to smashing the class ceiling in education or restoring the dignity of work or halving violence against women and girls. But whilst Neil Kinnock, John Smith, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown worked to take Labour from our worst defeat in generations in 1983 to election victory, in 1997, Keir's ambition is much bolder. To take Labour from our even worse general election defeat in even more generations in 2019, to offer the chance for the country of a Labour government again in just five years. But there's something else that feels harder now and feels different now, which is that fracturing of trust and the fragmentation of society it feels so much greater than when I first started working for John. Whether that's through the damage done to our communities or the amplification on social media, but also I believe the reckless disregard for truth, trust and standards, not just by Boris Johnson, but swathes of the Conservative Party and the deliberate politics of division that has undermined trust in a very deep way. But if anything, that makes John's style of politics rooted in decency and respect even more important. So let me just finish on two final thoughts about and from John. Because this has been a tough 14 years in opposition, an up and down time for the Labour Party. But actually it's some of the words that John said to me that have kept me going through thick and thin. And they're words that I have repeated to many Labour Party events fundraisers, particularly events for young activists, through times when things felt grim over the last 14 years. It was April the 10th, 1992, the day after the 92 general election, the election that I thought hoped we would win and that we lost. And Anne Barrett, John's secretary, had organised a gathering to thank all the young researchers and staff who had worked for the party. They, of course, turned into a bit of a wake until John spoke. He gave me a hug. I think he gave everyone a hug and he really was not a huggy person. And he said to us, you feel despair now, but I don't because I look around this room. And as long as I see young people like you believing in the Labour Party, believing in Labour values and ideas and being ready to fight for them, I know we have a future. And then let me leave you finally with John words, John's words from the night before he died in a speech 30 years ago, words that sum up so much of who John was and what I believe the Labour Party stands for, that sense of purpose, that sense that the holding of a high office is a remarkable responsibility to those who you seek to represent and that how you govern, how you conduct politics matters, that what you can achieve for others and the change our country needs is what matters most of all. And what he said was the opportunity to serve our country. That is all we ask. That was John Smith. Thank you.